welcome everyone it's it's so lovely to see two pages full of photos on a zoom call not often do we see that when we're having our little meetings especially over covid um but this is lovely to see you um for the first thing i want to do is tell you it is my pleasure very much so my pleasure to introduce ellen ryan ellen is a professor emeritus from mcmaster she's a leader of hamilton aging and community a local group educating Hamilton residents and beyond about resilient aging in community and advocating for improving opportunities for seniors to contribute and to provide mutual support. With us today are Indigenous leaders, Kitty Lickers, Val Kerr, and by video, Tiana Kress. I'll provide a more formal in introduction to these uh, to these people in a few minutes. And now we'll ask uh, uh, Ellen to start her hurdle talk for us. Well, I want to welcome everybody uh, on behalf of Hamilton Aging and Community, and especially to thank our interfaith sponsors for today, Trinity Lutheran Church, Concerned Lay Catholics, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Hamilton, and Meadowlands Fellowship Christian Reformed Church. Thanks so much for their sponsorship. And I wanna thank Donna for recruiting our three speakers for today and for facilitating this session. I think Donna and I have formed an enduring friendship over uh, the development of this project. And thanks to all of you participants for joining us today and a little nod to uh, Mother Nature and the creator who offered us a rainy Saturday so that it's uh, we've got quite a group today. A few words about the setup. This session will be recorded with only the speakers visible. The link to the recording will be distributed along with our resource list afterwards. The audience will be muted as was mentioned to manage sound and so that we can keep to our time limit. We would invite your questions, please put them in the chat. Loretta jones Aarons, who you've encountered already, co-leader of Hamilton Aging and Community, will monitor the questions and pose them to the speakers on our behalf. Tiana Kress for the Hamilton Regional Indian Center, also known as the Friendship Center, is presented by video while she's answering our questions. There will be a few minutes for questions after each of the other two speakers. Let's begin with a prayer. Prayer to the Creator. Help us, O Creator, to see differences and diversity at strength. Help us to listen and understand, to meet one another with wonder and anticipation. Help us to love as you love without expectation. Reveal to us your way of reconciliation and guide us into right relationships with all living things. The territorial acknowledgement is a common practice among committees now. And um, so I'd like to read you the one that we have created. We, we acknowledge that the lands we live, work and meet on are the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee and Mississauga. This land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to chair to, to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase, 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. As settlers, it is our responsibility to learn about and acknowledge our colonial history and the ways in which we may continue to perpetuate it. As people of faith, we are called to discern how we are to respond to the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, now it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and professor, Kitty R. Lynn Lickers. 
McMaster and Guelph University's Indigenous Studies instructor. Kitty is an Onondaga woman from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. And I, before I say this about Kitty, I want to point out to other others here how important kinship is to Indigenous people. And so you will hear me reading the relationships among our leaders today to their families. Kitty is a mother, grandma or Kiki, auntie, sister and daughter. She is an instructor at McMaster and Guelph Universities, teaching in the way she lives. Kitty is always mindful of the connections among us all, the land, wind and life that surrounds us, always being mindful of caring for each other to care for our mother earth. And you can start your presentation, Kitty, if you would like. Um, we're going to take this screen down so we can see your face. And where are you? <laughs> I know you're here. If, if you click on your speaker view at the, in the top right corner, you'll be able to see the speaker. Hear me or not? Well, we yes. can hear you, yes. Here you are at okay. the bottom right on mine. Oh, okay. The fewer cameras, the better. The fewer cameras that are on, the better. Okay. Just because that doesn't take up the bandwidth of the... Not that I don't want to see faces because it's there always... There you are. There you are. Okay, I'm getting okay. myself out of here. Okay. Well, thank you, Donna, for the introduction. Um, I'm always torn when people ask me for a bio. I like, do people want to know about me or do they want to know about what I do? Do they want to know who I talk to? Do they want to know what I talk about? Um, do they want me to say I have several associate degrees and I have an undergrad and I have a master's and do they want that stuff or do they want to know that my favorite thing to do is play patty cake with my granddaughter? Like, what do they want to know? Those are the kind of things that I always wonder. A bio should say she prefers pink lollipops overall. And if you give her chocolate, she'll be your friend forever. So that's the things that should be in a bio, I think. Um, especially, you know, I, we as we get older, we we understand the things that are more important that are that make a that make a difference that are impactful to the world. And knowing that a person likes chocolate or doesn't like chocolate is very important. So um, I just want to start off. I, I didn't really understand what I was going to talk about or what I was supposed to talk about, even though I'm sure Donna was very clear. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank everyone for um, taking the time out to include this as part of their day, for the people that invited me, um, for being here at this moment, for this taking, um, bringing us all together in this second of the day. Um, and you never know how important that is. You never know what one thing you say could be of import to someone. I wake up every morning and before I get out of bed, um, I, I say five things that I'm grateful for before I ever lift my head off the pillow. Five things that I'm grateful for. And this morning I was torn because I was like, I don't know if you guys know this, um, if Donna mentioned or not, but I'm in the Dominican with my family. <laughs> so I'm like, I want to be grateful for being able to share with everyone, but it's also like, you know, 90 degrees and the pool is very blue and I want to still be in there. And my grandkids are like, Kiki, where are you going? I'm like, I have to do a talk. They're like, you're working today? What? Uh, I'm like, oh yeah, maybe. So um, I know the whole the thing about talking about aging and I, and I say thing and I shouldn't say that, the whole discussion about aging in my opinion, should not need to be. There should be no need for this kind of discussion, no kind, of, this kind of conversation. Um, it shouldn't be necessary. Our seniors and our elders um, should be cared for and loved and and looked after until their last breath. That that's what we should do as as humans, right? As one taking care of each other. I mean, I know that a lot um, of people really are, and there, and there are a lot that are not, right? So these kind of discussions have to happen in the way of the world right now, which is kind of wild and wooly, all, all things considered. Because I often wonder, um, why is it in, in the creator's world of so much abundance? Um, do we need programs? Do we have 
these programs that are for bringing food to our elders and bringing company, right? Even just having someone to talk to. Um, if, if there's a, uh, I think as for me, um, understanding as fellow that we're all just human beings, right? We're all about how things might be a little bit different for, for me being indigenous. Because first of all, and I never really, I didn't introduce myself more than what Don did. And I should say that I live right on the reserve, Six Nations Reserve. Um, I actually live in a with my mother. So yeah, I don't know if you can see kind of a little pattern there, <laughs> um, but for, for um, in intergenerational families on the reserve, that's that's a more common thing. So if a if a parent or an elderly person needs care, then quite often they're in the home and it's being provided right there. There's a great number of services um, on the reserve, and I'm I'm unsure if if that's what you want me to do. Do you want me to just say, well, here's what we have and here's what kitty you're go you're cutting in and out i just wanted to see yes i think what listeners are interested in is about what's happening on six nations can you hear me maybe, maybe people can turn um, on their video um should Turn I talk about off, so that, that or should I talk about why are they needed? Yeah. Should I say, well, the impacts of, okay. Yes, yes, yeah, I do have that, Donna. I just like, okay, um, Adrian, that boost. So can you, can you hear me? Okay, no? Now we can, the, the picture keeps coming and going now, but at least we can hear you sometimes, but then it, it goes. But the thing about the reserve is I know that you have a lot of interaction with the seniors in the home there. Yeah, and so how they are, and how they are looked after in all ways, spiritually, yeah. uh, physically, uh, nutritionally, I know you're very much a nutritionist and that's the kind of thing that um, that I think we'd, we'd like to know what's happening there, how many people, are in the home there? Um, are they happy? You know, is it a good location? I know uh, in the urban setting, it's not the same. Well, I will say this, in the, the Iroquois Lodge does not have sufficient number of beds for the people that we need. Um, and, and Donna, I this is gonna be difficult to understand, but I need at least one face to look at, one person's interactive face, I don't know. Ellen, maybe you could leave your camera on someone yeah there we go that's better i really have a hard time talking to a black screen i don't know if you guys have that difficulty one of the things that i wanted to make sure that everyone understood that that the need to have this is something that's always in discussion we do have we have the iroquois lodge i have a huge list of services that, that our seniors um and elders have access to so like we have um we have a whole bunch of individual programs through health services, diabetes programs, foot care programs, um, nutrition programs. We have a program called Adult Day where they're able to go to an, um, a daytime program where they have people to look after them. If, if um, family needs to take a break, um, then they're brought there and they're able to spend the day and they do crafts and they have a meal together at lunchtime and they have snacks for them and there's activities and puzzles and the TV is there and, and it's a big space. It's a nice space in health services that they, it, it's kind of like, um, I keep telling my kids, I can hardly wait till I'm like in a spot where I need adult day so that I can go there and have lunch with everybody and hang out and do puzzles because that's what I want to do. It's kind of like our, it's kind of like um, our spot to go sort of like, um, like our, our, our senior daycare kind of center and they love it like there's a lot of folks that are capable of walking there from their home which is close so they walk over it's it's also community right it's a way to interact with people 
Um, they have different little programs that are offshoots of that, like the Silver Fox, which is a, a group that are, they're mobile, so, or some of them are, so they'll travel together to go out to dinner, or they'll travel together to go to the movies, and they kind of look out for each other in that way, and a few of them have, um, like, workers that will go with them just to make sure that all is well. Um, the Iroquois Lodge, uh, I, I know there's, it's, they're in the process now of them building a much larger one. The Iroquois Lodge has been around a long time and it's, in, um, it's kind of a, it, it's a building that everyone looks after. It's like everyone, whoever you are in the community, whether you have a family member at the lodge or not, and COVID kind of stopped that a bit. But if whether you have a family member there or not, you would stop in. You would stop in and say, you know, I have a half an hour or I have a little bit of time. I'm just going to, is there anything I can do to help? Or you just sit and chat with folks or, or they'd be sitting out front. And, and I, love, I love our old fellas that sit out front of the, the lodge. And I know everybody's like, everybody's going to have their own opinion of it. But I love when they sit out there and they're smoking their little cigarettes and they're like, what are you doing here? Why are you here? What do you want? What are you asking me today? And then I, you know, I'd sit and talk with them. And, and after a while, they start to look for me, right? They started to look for me. So I still go quite often and, and sit with them. And if, but there's one, one old fellow goes, you won't sit by me because I smoke. I said, I still won't sit by you because you stink. You stink like a smoke. So when I come to visit him now, he goes, I just had a smoke. I not smoke till you come back. I'm like, okay, good. Then I'll sit by you. They're looking for company there. And, and that's one of the things that you can do there at the lodge. There's other things. And like Donna said, food is within the adult day where if there's just not quite enough food in their house to make it to pay to check day, um, then they can get a little bit to, you know, a box of cereal or some soup or something. And they get a lunch there too. So um, there's also the food bank where, and they have um, workers that will take the um, seniors over to the food bank to get food, and that's um, um, it's right in the village. Um, there was there's an emergency food program which began because of COVID, but they found. So I was in charge of the um, a big part of of the um, emergency food, and what we discovered was um, a lot of them a lot of the seniors needed just that tiny bit of help at the end of the month and one story sticks with me and I always I have trouble telling it but I'll tell it anyway one of the fellas he phoned and he goes I'm looking for some of that emergency food and I said oh you know I'd answered the phone and I said what I just need your address I we don't we didn't ask for anything other than that how many were in the house and how much food to take and um, we had delivery drivers that were doing doing it during COVID and dropping it off um, because, and that, that that's a whole story in itself, but he said, well, I only want crackers. I have a can of soup. I have two cans of soup. He said, I was going to only tell you about one, but I have two. And if I divide it up, I'll make it to check day. And then someone can get me groceries. He said, so I just need crackers. I said, well, what else have you got in the house that I can send things to augment that? And he goes, um, no, I'm out of coffee. I'm out of tea, I'm out of milk, I'm out of butter. Um, nothing in my freezer. I got the soup. He goes, wait, I might have a jar of olives in the cupboard. Did you need that? And I'm like, honey, I don't, I don't need it. So I couldn't handle it. I begged up a double or um, order of the, the things to him. And even though COVID's over every once in a while, because I had access to his address, I will bag up a little bag of things at the end of the month and drop them off at his house. And he doesn't know it's me. Because it's just that tiny little bit that they need at the end, right? There's a lot of really good mental health services on the reserve. We have a, a mental health services program. And despite everything um, that's going on in the world, they are, there's a lot of people that need that, that service. But they're still very conscious of the fact that um, depression is a big thing for seniors when they don't have family to visit them or that, that sort of thing. So... 
um, they created little programs where um, workers will just stop in or phone during COVID. It was phone calls, but they will also stop in and see, hey, how you doing? Is there anything I can do for you or or whatever? So um, we have that. There's a suit for seniors program that I put together with um, the rest of uh, when I was working at health and it's literally we make pots of soup and we give out soup until it's all gone and usually it's a couple hundred people come through and get a bowl of soup once a week and crackers or bread or buns or whatever we make and um and when we actually made a recipe book for my recipes so that they could have it because they kept asking for the recipes and I was constantly sending the recipes to people um so that they could remake the soups that we sent out so that happens every um week still um and they actually look forward to it it's kind of cute because they'll get their soup in the nice weather and you'll know it's soup day because there'll be a whole bunch of seniors in the park right in the village sitting at the picnic tables having soup together which i think that is more important than the soup or as important as a soup oh <laughs> lasagna soup yeah that's kind of a favorite everybody loves lasagna soup that and gypsy stew which is really just a soup I made up out of leftovers. I had a couple of sausages and a few potatoes and dots and ends, and I made gypsy stew. And that's the that's the number one favorite is the gypsy stew. Um, they do provide cooking classes, which I really love. Um, and it's they're open to everyone, and we quite often will get seniors that join up. It's nice because not only do they get to come and um, um, make the the, the the soup or the food like they have a, a plant-based class they have um, a, a class that where you can um, where you learn how to make whatever is from the market that week because we also have a food market in the village um, that they're able to come to and we did um a, a, we we were connected with a program that that offered vouchers to them you have to keep track of the time for me donna you know i have Lots of things written down, pages and pages, and I'm going to run out of time. Um, and so there's a class that goes with that, and there's a class that goes with the di diabetes. Does a class on cooking if you're diabetic, and they can they join up, they get the materials to make the food, and as well as cooking it in class and sharing it with the group that's in there. Um, I do canning classes. Uh, lots of seniors um, join my canning classes, which I was surprised because I always assume that you know, they would know how, but the canning classes are like one of the number one favorites. And um, and I love to do it because I do it with children and with seniors. And both of those classes, I run exactly the same, <laughs> exactly the same, and it's really fun. Um, so th there's that. We have a Meals on Wheels program um, that does have a cost associated with it, but it's not very much. Um, Jay Silver's Heels is a program that has like long range care. Um, there are community nurses that quite often are called out by family to check on our seniors. Um, and I'm, I'm just trying to see what time it is. So, oh, okay, I'm running out of time aren't I Donna. Okay, so the paramedics do a really cool program called Santa to a Senior. So the paramedics actually there, they choose a senior and they do a, a, a Christmas for them um, or a holiday for them. Um, home and community care goes into the homes, does um, housekeeping, slight housekeeping and checks on them. And I know that all of these programs sound really super cool. And I know for a fact there are still people who are missed. We do our very best. We do our very best. And that's cultural for us. That's part of who we are that's that's a that connection of, of um to our seniors and elders is very strong we closed our reserve during covid we bl blockaded every entrance to it so that we could protect our seniors that's what that pro that was actually called that's why we did it um there's a, a building on our reserve called the joe and it's um the the um youth and seniors um building and and then that center is specific con for connecting our youth um, with the seniors in in some way they do things together they interact in the same building like they you'll go in the building and there'll be kids in one room doing games and and that room is open to the next room beside it where there's like eight ladies sitting there knitting or crocheting things and they're they're together in the same rooms it's kind of fun especially for me because there's a couple of older ladies who are like 
make them stop. Make them stop right now. They're talking too much. They're talking too much. And then invariably, and I think this is, again, a cultural thing. One of those youth will go over and say, how can we fix this for you? And I've watched that happen so many times that interaction or you'll see the seniors there's a gymnasium in there in the dojo and um the youth will be playing basketball but then the senior talking about how good that one looks or when i when i did that um it says my internet's unstable we do have a long-term care program and we do have the the it's relatively um new i we've always provided palliative care through the hospitals but I know that there's a program down on the reserve now that um Cindy does right so I want to give a couple I know I wanted I wanted people to be able to ask questions please um I have I have four minutes left Donna I'll take questions no no kitty you have more than that you have uh we have you until 255 but we thought we'd leave some room for questions because I know there's probably a lot out there. Yeah, so I'm happy to answer questions. Oh, I see someone said three sisters. That's also a favorite. I, I more often than not do twisted sister, which is corn beans and squashes at three sisters. Um, um, three twisted sister has got greens in it, and it's more substantial, more more uh, vitamin enriched with the. Uh, greens and stuff um i i probably have a ton more stuff that i could talk about but i would i want to give people a chance to um ask questions about the things that i shared i just want to say this i'm i'm blessed i'm very fortunate i'm always grateful um for the things that i have in my life i know um i was really lucky to be able to take care of my mom after my dad passed and to have been with my dad for his last um, year. But I think there's so many folks that don't have that. And if there was one thing, if I had one wish to wish um, for, for seniors and elders would be that if you have a moment, if you have you know 15 minutes, go and have a cup of tea with someone. You know, find that there's every organization has a list of, of folks um, that they take medicine to or that they take food to or that they do, um, you know, um, e even church services for. They want more than that. They need more than that. It, that's the most. We all know that food is not nourishing enough, right? Is there's more to it. One of the most. Um, important things that I see um, for our seniors and our elders that happens on the reserve that I don't see everywhere else is nine times out of 10. And I, I'm just picking this store out of random. You go into Giant Tiger, most often you'll see a whole bunch of kids, a mom and a grandma, or a whole bunch of kids and a grandma and a grandpa, right? Because they there's interaction of the family, that connection. But this is the part to remember. They don't have to be blood family. I have lots of folks that I visit with and that I my even my kids go and see. And I just Delta comes to mind, an older lady on that on, on she's a new credit. Um, she loves my granddaughter. She loves my daughter. They'll stop in and see her. She's in her 70s. Um, she's She's got a crazy accent. She lived in the States for a while in Tennessee. So she sounds really crazy. They just think her accent's crazy, but she can drive. And her life evolves around the visits from people. She has enough food. We make sure of that. She has all her medicine. We make sure of that. But she needs that. The creator did not mean for anyone to stride through this world alone. You know, that was one of the things that, that I think was imparted to me by my parents that you, you know, you always look out for, for your seniors, the seniors and the elders. And, and there's such a division and I could have gone into a huge discussion about why truth and reconciliation makes all of this 
important and how the world will be changed by truth and reality. There's not, it's not enough to acknowledge the truth of things, but that reconciliation component, I think a part of what will happen with that is if people look at how do we make a seniors, an indigenous seniors life better, will be like a little um, wake up where I go, well, what about this, the older lady that lives down the street from me? What about that man that I see, you know, standing there looking in the coffee shop? What about, you know, it, 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 it's, it's uh, Donna knows this. I'm a big, huge, huge believer that, that Indigenous folks have the answers. And some of you are going to be like, what in the heck is she talking about? But we do. The creator gave them to us. And because of um, oral conversations and the carrying on of knowledge, we have the answers. But guess what? We can't do it alone. It's not just for us to do. It's for all of us to do. It's for us to all join hands, for all of us to link our elbows and say, how can we make our mother earth the best that she can, we, she can be? How can we make sure there's enough food for everyone to eat? How can we make sure that our elders and seniors are cared for? How can we be sure that our children are safe and, and loved? We have to do that together. That's not something that can be done um, by one group of people. We are all human beings. We are all human beings on this planet. The creator, God, however you designate that higher power, they want us to be together doing that. It is important. I pray, and maybe when I say I'm grateful or I give thanks uh, uh, for the things that the creator's given, perhaps that doesn't strike other people as a prayer, but it is. If you think of the Thanksgiving address, it tells you what to do. It tells you what we must do, right? So that's the impactful. I'm taking up the question time. I'm sorry. Like I said, Donna, I know, have Kitty, this that, no, so, Kitty, that was so a sorry. wonderful way to fin to wrap up what you were talking about because it's so true what you're saying. I mean, I love that, and I know that um, the the Thanksgiving address will be uh, people will be unfamiliar with that, but it is something that we could post as a resource for people to read, Ellen, and I'll do that. The other thing, Kitty, I wanted to ask is in my note, I, I'm so happy to have known you. I think one of the things that I enjoyed so much in, with you was your community gardening. And um, I wondered if you're ever going to be doing that again and offering um, those classes online and possibly to participants outside of Six Nations. Well, um, the the gardening classes, because as Donna knows, and anyone that goes to my classes, they're not just about gardening. It's about life. So that's wow. a big part of it. And, I, and I'm and i going to say this right now. If, if you are interested, if you would like, I'm happy to do um, online classes like this um, to, to do. And I'll just, and I'll do like I did before Donna, just run through the, the entire year. Um, we can do it once a week. We can do it every other week. Um, it doesn't, it's not tied to the community garden. The community garden is still being run there on a uh, um, on a small scale. But if you've ever, if you, it, I don't know if any of you have been on there, but gardening classes with me are all about, uh, all about being the best that you can be. Not just growing plants. It's about being the best that you can be. And, and when you, I, I've had so many people come up and say, I want to do that class with you again and again and again. And I'm okay with that. I'm happy for that to happen. I want people to do that. And I, for me, it's the very best when it's like folks that are like my age or older or, you know, in and in around there, because it's so fun because they get some of my jokes that some of the younger folks don't get. <laughs> and that's, there's that part of it. But yeah. Um, so yeah, Donna, that is a, so if you want to, if you, any of you want to do that, if, does anyone have any questions? Do you, do you have uh, hi, thoughts? Hi, hi, Kitty. It's Loretta hi. here. And I'm the, hi. I'm the question monitor for today. Okay. So, um, so that uh, all 40 people don't um, hit you at once with their questions. Um, I'm asking people to please put their questions in the chat. You can do that now. 
and then um, I will uh, ask Kitty those questions so we uh, watch the time and also don't duplicate. So um, Ellen Ryan sent in a, a question uh, very early in your talk, Kitty, and she asked how seniors um, are supported in continuing to make contributions to the community. So you talked about a lot of the help that Six Nations offers seniors. Um, what do you do to involve them in, in the community on committees or on, um, you okay, know, so, kind of things? Yeah. Got it, got it. I understand what you're asking me. So um, every single time there is an organization there's a, that has a, um, um, a committee of uh, advisory committee um, that we make sure that there's a senior and elder on those committees. Like we ask for them, we will specifically ask. You have to understand that a lot of our folks are, um, if they attend Longhouse or church, quite often they're, an important part of either one of those. We have both, and we do have some folks who um, are strong longhouse folks who did attend churches um, so that they know the things that, that, that they think are important. And, and that is part of the visiting. Like I will quite often, I keep using Delta and she'd be happy to know that I was using her as an example. Quite often I'll load Delta up in the car with me and we'll go visit someone else. So we make those kind of connections and there's a lot of connection made where um, our seniors and our elders are given um, opportunities to teach. Like we very rarely run a program without uh, having an elder or a senior there, literally um, just uh, as recognition to them, but also uh, to, to garner the knowledge that they carry. Because that's one of the most important things is the carrying on of the knowledge that that they have acquired over their life. And our youth is very cognizant of that. And that's one of the most beautiful things of our the, the knowledge that our seniors have. We also do things like at the community garden, they used to come. And not all of them could get in the garden. So we would have them do things at, at the garden garden that they could store the vegetables, clean the tools at tables. I had a little group of us to do a garden space once, which if you had seen it, you would have. There's also a ton of um, education programs that are run through social services and health services and through council. And the, uh, there's a lot of organizations on the reserve and everyone, um, every, like I said, every organization is quick and import, more importantly, um, requires that, that, yeah, the the presence of them there is the service that they're giving because we are then acknowledging their presence and they're sharing because the creator doesn't give you the opportunity to garner information and knowledge without the admonishment to also share that. So that's what they must do as well. So to be of service is what they do. To be of service to them is what we do. So and there we are again, where I said, it's more of a, the most important thing is connection. It's always about connection. Our next speaker is another friend. I've known Val for quite a long time. Um, Val is a proud Mohawk woman, a member of the Wolf Clan, Tyanandaga Nation, Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte. She is an educator, a widow, mother, mother-in-law, grandmother, grandmother-in-law, great-grandmother, cousin, sister, auntie, and friend. Val is a member of the Council of General Synod for the Anglican Church of Canada, Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of St. Matthew's House in Hamilton, Knowledge Keeper for the Youth Justice Council of the Primates World Relief and Development Fund. She's a member of the Water Group as well. Formerly, Val worked in palliative care for 13 years, an on-call chaplain for 30 years, and a parish priest for over 15 years. Val loves working with all people, youth having a special place in her heart, and believes strongly in lifelong learning. 
her two sons, eight grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren, along with their partners, are the center of her life. Val holds a Master of Divinity. Um, she's a retired Archdeacon of Truth, Reconciliation, and Indigenous Ministry for the Anglican Diocese of Niagara. Today, she's going to talk to us about um, Indigenous end-of-life care and some of the other roles she has uh, performed in service to the community. She's a wonderful person to know, and Val actually uh, runs our, our Kairos Blanket exercise at St. Joseph's Parish, which we will put on as a resource. The next one is coming up on June 3rd, and uh, you can read about that through the link on that resource. Val, you need to take it away. <laughs> but you're on mute, Val. I know I am not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's lovely to be with all of you here today. Um, and it, it's so interesting for me to hear what other reserves are doing and how much overlap there is on my own reserve, as opposed to what we just heard from Six Nations. Uh, Tyendinaga is um, east of Belleville, if you know the area at all. Uh, we're Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty, keepers of the Eastern Door, Gnugi Haga. So, uh, we do have a lot in common. And whether we all know it or not, we're all connected. Each and every one of us are connected in this web of life. So I thought what I would talk about, I could talk about the same kind of uh, programs that are available on my reserve, uh, but I also don't live on reserve. So I deal with a lot of urban uh, initiatives and therefore St. Matthew's House in Hamilton is uh, pretty high on my list right now because we are in the midst of building 16 deeply affordable apartments for seniors of black and indigenous culture. Uh, and these seniors will have been um, perhaps losing their homes. So uh, we're really excited about that. But let's talk about palliative care, which is always part of what I will do. Whether we know it or not, we do that. But I, I'd like to start out by leaving this um, I'm just gonna say this to you. When indigenous people leave their traditional homes, their territories to find a better life in the city, they can become disconnected, disillusioned, damaged and depressed. And that's what we deal with. You know, uh, a lot of people who come from the reserves are looking for a better life. They are looking for something different than they have experienced. However, uh, like we heard, being part of a community is very, very important. And so we're, we're glad that there are organizations who do try to, like the friendship centers, who do those, who have all kinds of programs for urban indigenous people. Um, I guess the, the biggest thing for me has always been, what does the person want? Not to go into a situation thinking that we have all the answers. Um, I might be dealing with an indigenous family who have no roots in their traditions. So for me to go in and ask them if they want to smudge, it might mean nothing to them. Where on the other hand, we might have an Indigenous family who are very active in those, uh, those the cultural part of their lives, the spiritual part of their lives, and really want those traditions, the smudging, the drumming, the singing, and all are very important in our ritual. Um, indigenous people, as, as an Indigenous person, 
I was never taught about death. Death was part of life always. Uh, children were included in everything. Nothing was kept from us as far as the death went. And so we grew up with death being something that's natural, that's naturally a part of life. And I need to tell you, it is so sacred to walk with people who are in the, in the last part of their earthly journey. It is a sacred time to spend with people and getting to know them is the most sacred thing. I have been so blessed to meet so many wonderful people. We love telling stories. When I was doing, actually I have a, a certificate in palliative care multidisciplinary. And uh, as part of that certificate, I needed to do a, uh, a stint in the hospital. And I love hospital work. Uh, obviously I was an on-call chaplain for 30 years. So I love hospital work. But this was specifically palliative. And they called me from the hospital and told me about a patient they had and asked me if I could go and visit him. So I said, sure. When I arrived, I went to the nurse's station and, and the nurses were saying, oh my gosh, you got him. Have you got your hands full? He is not a happy camper. <laughs> Well, folks, that's not what I found at all. That's not what I found at all. My husband was a Marine engineer and this gentleman just happened to be a merchant Marine. We had tons to talk about and we formed a very solid relationship. Uh, and I was able to journey with him until he took his last breath and, and, and beyond. And beyond, I have to say, because I went to his funeral and even at his funeral, I learned things about him. And so this man who people saw as not a happy camper, when he never was married, never had any children, but when he came home from being away on the ship, soon as the children in his community saw his vehicle at home, they would all gather because they knew his trunk was going to be full of things for them. So, you know, I guess that's a story to say, you never know what you're going to get. Just go with the flow, listen to, listen to the needs. What, what are their needs? It's not about what our needs are. And, and it's not always easy working in palliative care, but it is very rewarding. Uh, just to see families interact. And sadly, there's a lot of people like we heard alone. Um, when Donna asked me to do this, I thought about my own family and what, you know, what do we face as we age? I'm fortunate to be able to live alone, uh, but I've had stints where my, my children come back home and I love it. Uh, and we celebrate it for all that it is. And then they, they go back about their lives. Um, but when I, I was home recently for an auntie's funeral and when one of the things I realized at that service is there are a lot of my own family who don't know our cultural traditions, especially around death and dying. Um, our, our, like we heard, our family members would never be taking, taken out of the home. Uh, we would look after them at home. But what we're running into now are elders living great long lives and they're, they're their children becoming ill. So the children who would normally take over that caregiving need care for themselves. So it's a, it's a big thing going on right now. I would say um, we have an elders lodge uh, similar to what they have on Six Nations. 
And yes, people can go there for care. Uh, however, only to a point. Um, I know that my cousin was quite upset because she had to place my auntie in care, but she had dementia and she couldn't be left alone. And at first my cousin was working and then she became ill. So thank goodness for community because when you're in community, there's always someone who will care for you because that's what we do. We care for each other. And <laughs> like we heard, it doesn't matter whether we're biologically related or not. We're all family and, and that's how we treat each other. So urban indigenous people have different things to deal with and it's finding services. There's lots of services out there and, and I know about them, but it's getting that information to the individuals. Uh, because if we don't know, we don't know. Uh, St. Matthew's House does a lot of the same things that happen on the reserve. Uh, they have uh, daycares, um, they have street outreach workers for the city of Hamilton. Um, they, they also have cooking classes, mental health. They do a Christmas basket, which I was very impressed with the number of Christmas baskets that went out of that place at Christmas. But the most important thing I think is the social interaction. And um, there are programs with, you know, things called like friendly visitors. But if, if you don't know about those programs, you don't access them. So a lot of it is getting that word out. And, and to be quite honest, I am concerned about family my age who are very unwell and not able to look after their parent, whichever parent that may be, or maybe both parents. Uh, my mother came to live with me and uh, it was interesting and we had lots of laughs. <laughs> My mother was a spitfire, <laughs> all four foot 11 of her. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my friend said, how are you gonna do this when you're working full time? And I said, it is what it is. So I knew enough that I could get her into daycare programs, uh, into the friendly visitors. So I had people visiting with her when she was had to be at home. She was out at least three days a week with her day programs. And uh, other than that, it was her and I. And we did a lot of things together. I were wherever I could take her with me on my journeys, I did. And uh, she always had a good time because it's that social interaction that they really, that we all need. You know, it, 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 our previous speaker was right on when she said, we weren't created to be alone. And yet you walk the streets in these big cities and you see a lot of people alone. It breaks my heart when I see my brothers and sisters on the streets of Toronto because uh, Indigenous people are the highest, uh, make the highest numbers of street people in the city of Toronto. And I have, uh, I've actually taken youth into Toronto to, uh, to walk those streets, to interact with the homeless people. And one of the things I said to them before we went into this well-known park was remember we may think we're, we're walking into a park, but we're walking into someone's home. And I had youth come back to me afterwards and said that was the most profound experience they had in their lives, was to actually sit with people and hear their stories because we all have stories to tell and we can't not tell our stories. So, uh, it was it was a wonderful time we had, very eye-opening for 
obviously youth who come from uh, backgrounds that are privileged because they're able to go on these, pro join these programs. But um, it makes my heart warm just to see the difference in them and how they treat people. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I like about youth. Uh, this, this last chapter here, uh, the Youth Council, they're looking uh, to work for justice and young people who have a mission in life like that. And one of the things that um, they're looking at doing is starting a program to bring youth together, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, and give them experiences that they can share together. Uh, so one of the things I suggested to them was, how about going back to the land, going back to our mother, the earth, and learning how we should care for her and learning what we can do to provide what she provides for us. So uh, it looks like that may be one of the things they're going to try to put together. And, and I'll be there. Uh, I'll be there. Well, I yes. want to leave some time for people to, there are several questions in the chat. Okay. And mm -hmm. so um, it's now uh, almost, uh, what have we got here? It's 3.03. And wow. um, yeah, I know that went fast and, and I would listen to you forever. You know that. So um, maybe we could uh, let Loretta handle the uh, chat line sure. questions in there and we could uh, hear from you on the specific interests of people out there. Sure. Loretta, can you do that? Yes. Yeah. So thanks so much, Val, for, for talking about uh, walking with people at the end of their life and palliative care um, and homelessness, too. Um, Ken has a question. Um, I'll just read it directly. I won't mm -hmm. try to paraphrase it. He writes, um, are you hopeful about the ability of Indigenous communities to recover the heritage that has been lost? And can you comment on what is needed to make this happen? I am very hopeful. Of course, some people call me Pollyanna, <laughs> you know, but I am hopeful because as I go around educating, I am meeting more and more people who are interested in what's going on in Indigenous communities. I am, in, I am meeting more Indigenous people who are interested in learning about their culture because they've had it taken away from them. I'm also hopeful, uh, working in reconciliation, that's a word that a lot of people throw around quite quite freely, but what is reconciliation? Reconciliation isn't just a word. Being involved in reconciliation means that you are going to take action. I remember when uh, the Truth and Reconciliation filed their final report and listening to Marie Sinclair saying, you know, this is a wonderful report. We, we, you know, they sat with so many people to hear their stories and to interact with them. And they provided this wonderful report for the government. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, this report will sit on a shelf somewhere and gather dust. It's up to us to make the difference. If anything is going to change, it's up to us. And you know, I take that seriously. Um, I think it's hard for one person alone to see change. However, I have witnessed change. Um, uh, even on my own reserve, I've witnessed change. People getting back to basics, people learning oh, what are the strawberries? What about the strawberries? Uh, and that's a teaching for us. Um, 
So there's so many teachings that we have in our communities. I think we can all, all benefit from. Is that helpful? I think so. Thank you very much. And we have a few questions here. So we'll go on to the next one from Ellen. Um, she asks, are there any cultural tips from your heritage to help all of us to promote intergenerational connections, especially connecting, uh, listening, um, listening between youth with seniors and elders? Mm -hmm. There's nothing better than bringing seniors and elders together. Uh, we, we, our communities work on a circle, right? And everyone in that circle has a part, an important part in our community from the eldest to the youngest. And that's something that I think a lot of people have lost. Like people will say to me, for instance, your family is always together. How do you keep your family together? Um, I do it without thinking because that's how I was raised. We were always together. Um, so right from the first grandchild that we had till now, I make sure cousins get together because they don't live in the same cities. So we would bring them all to our house and they would stay with us and get to know each other. We, we did all kinds of things together. We also taught them. We also taught them because as a grandparent in our communities, uh, I was practically raised by my grandparents because my parents both worked. And so it's not unusual for us to have many generations living in one household or many generations teaching our children because it takes a village to raise a child. So I, I, maybe I got off track there. What, what was the question again? Um, so intergenerational or tips to bring mm. the generations together. And I, I like what you said about being intentional as a grandma, mm -hmm. you know, to bring all the grandchildren, the cousins together, even though they're spread all over the place. Yeah. That's yeah. important. Yeah. Any, anything it. else? And you get to know them in a different way. Another thing that we do as a family is um, oh, we're going to have a powwow again this summer. And we haven't had one since COVID. But that's a good place to bring elders and, and youth together. Because you see, you see people dancing from the, the youngest to the eldest. And they're in, that, they're in that circle together. They're interacting together. You can see them talking to each other and encouraging each other. And it's just that sense of cohesiveness. You know, we're here for a common purpose. And that common purpose is social. It's a social. Um, I always, when people ask me, what, what is a powwow like? There's different kinds of powwows and ours is just what they call a traditional powwow. No prizes or things like that. It's just, I, I say it's like a family reunion huh. with food trucks <laughs> because food is very important. And if anyone hasn't, if you haven't been out to the powwow at Six Nations. Oh it's yes. Just, it's just what Val was saying. Everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter what background you come from. And as you said, food is important. And I like to go there every year and, um, and be welcomed. It's great. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. This one's from Marie. Um, I would, she says, I would love to hear more about the youth program where you, where you took them into the park and talked with some homeless people in their home. Okay. Um, could I reach out to you about this? Sure. Um, now, the program I was working for at the time, I don't think is running anymore. Uh, but the street uh, sanctuary in Toronto actually is an old church, and it is a sanctuary for, for street people. And that's, that's where I made my uh, introduction. And I met the uh, ED there and I, I was able to take a few groups and we even cooked for the community. 
which was which is done totally different in the sense of not only do you cook for that community when it's cooked you sit down and you eat with the participants and uh they found me over in the over over at a table playing cards <laughs> so there again there's the food and the social interaction and yes i can talk to, i would be happy to talk to somebody about that place thank you and um here's donna's question um we have to acknowledge that change involves all of us and that discrimination does not have a home here we must look at our differences as strengths so what is the influence of ancestors who have passed um, on living descendants what have our ancestors passed what is what is the influence of your ancestors who have passed away? What is their influence on the living mm -hmm. in your community? For, for me personally, uh, my grandmother was my role model. Uh, if anyone in our community was in need, they always knew they could go to my grandmother. Um, I have a lot of cousins, let me tell you, I have a lot of cousins and um, not, well, a while back, I had the occasion to have them all. We unfortunately we were in the funeral home because one of our cousins' sons had died. But I had all my cousins in a circle, and I said to them, "Who do you think was Grandma's favorite? Our mm -hmm. Duda. Who do you think Duda? Who do you think her favorite was?" And you can be sure that every hand in that circle went up yeah. <laughs> because that's the way we were treated. And so I treat others the way I would like to be treated. And that comes from my community. So, and certainly from our grandparents had a huge influence on our lives because our lives were chaotic. They were full of abuses because of the intergenerational trauma and the residential schools. Uh, and I was in a, I had an occasion the other day to be with a group of people who were talking about that intergenerational trauma and mentioned that there are people who have come through that in a healthy way. And I have to say that I am so blessed. And I tell my children all the time how blessed we are to have broken those cycles of abuse. So that's what we can learn from our ancestors. Uh, it's really sad when you see a community whose, whose history was the women were the voice of the community. They ran our communities. They made the rules. They told the men what to do. And now we've gone to a point where we have to provide programs to teach our men how to treat the women and children. So that's what colonization has done. But if we go back and look at our ancestors and what they taught, we will, will be much healthier. That's pretty profound. Um, Donna um, just pointed out that the uh, Six Nations information on their powwow in July is in the resource list, which everyone will get later. Perfect. And it is. Uh, thank you for mentioning yes. that. It is. It was too hot for me last year, but uh, we we tried to make our way there too. It's it's a much bigger and it's a competition powwow, so that would be the difference. And the regalia is just amazing. And I would say to people, just keep in mind that uh, not to snap pictures, always to ask first if you could take someone's picture. And they go through all that uh, at the powwow. All those, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so those are all the questions that we have um, for you, Val. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll turn over to you, Donna, unless Val, you want to. Val, I, you know, I else? love you. I love you so much. And I think that this has been a great, great lesson for all of us. And uh, 
we have a little bit of a history we go back with and I'm I'm happy that you am in my life anyway and I think that you make a huge difference to many people in in this world in the area that you live in and beyond and so and um and I'm appreciative for that I just I feel like um people in the white white world sometimes don't understand the spirituality and the kindness and the loving nature of indigenous people and i'm happy to have found that so thank you thank you thank you val i really appreciate it and uh we have one more video presentation are you going to stay with us val yes i am okay, great all right so um my, my family's not coming till four oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> okay great so um we're going to um share a video after i tell you about tiana I'm sorry that Tiana can't be with us today. She's a lovely young woman. Um, she's a lifelong care program director at the Hamilton Regional Indian Center. I know we have many friendship centers across Canada, but she, they call the one in Hamilton, the HRIC, Hamilton Regional Indian Center. Um, she, she's going to talk to us on this video about the urban indigenous seniors experience, as well as inviting all of us to participate in some of the programs. Tiana is of, of the Manigan Dodem or Wolf Clan. She's a proud Anishinaabe Ojibwe Kwa, which means woman, from Garden River First Nation. She is a daughter, mother, sister, auntie, cousin, and friend. She grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, and 19 years ago she moved to southwestern Ontario and is a helper in the Hamilton community. And uh, Loretta's going to start the video now for us. Representing Hamilton Aging in the community, and today I'm very pleased to be with the Lifelong Care Program Director of the Indigenous Friendship Center in Hamilton. Her, and I'm going to try this, her Indigenous Cause, did I get that right? Or her name is Tiana Cress. Tiana is of the Meganon, Dodin, or Wolf Clan. Proud and Shinabi Ojibwe or a woman from Garden River First Nation. She is a daughter, mother, sister, auntie, cousin, and friend. She grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, and 19 years ago she moved to southwestern Ontario and is a helper in the Hamilton community. We are grateful to Tiana for being with us today. Thank you. It's such a warm welcoming. <laughs> well, it's lovely to have you here. Um, the audience that's watching this today is basically made up of seniors wanting to have it, more information about Indigenous urban seniors in the city of Hamilton. And that's why we're here today. So we'd be happy to hear a little bit about the Friendship Center. And um, you'll, you'll get some information on that and then we'll go into some questions and answers if that's all right with you. Absolutely. And I would like to know. From the perspective of seniors in Hamilton, non-Indigenous seniors, um, the contributing roles of older Indigenous adults, including how they interact with grandchildren and other young people, and about their resilience to everything they've been through. Mm -hmm. Being able to have a place to practice our traditional ways without judgment, while being met with love and support, is definitely a key factor within the Indigenous communities. These were the ways that we were raised with. These were the ways that were taken from us. So being able to use them and see them in practice is very sacred. That many of our seniors have experienced having um, their culture taken from them. So they're starting from the beginning again. So walking into a place without judgment um, and being able to learn, even from the basics, starting with a smudge, um, is one of the things we like to support. Typically, the traditional ways um, within our culture to have a multi-generational family is where the children would take the senior or the grandparent into the home to care for them, and so on and so forth, and we pass that down. However, with the cost of living, um, being in a city, that proves to be very difficult, and sometimes our seniors are left behind with little support. Thank you for that. Um, we did cover that there are the contributing roles mm -hmm. of Indigenous adults. Their resilience always passes. 
the, um, the seniors' resilience. And I, I always think that they have that ability to call upon the strength of their ancestors to guide them through the rest of their lives. But it worries me about intergenerational trauma and how that gets passed on. Um, is the, when, you're, when you're dealing with, like you were saying, in the city, the spaces are small so that everyone can't live together. But there, I think there must be some sort of reciprocity among the family members to, to look after the senior. Is there anything like that that you could comment on in, in the Hamilton? Or are they on the own? Um, I would like to say that it's completely possible for families to take in their seniors. Um, but to be completely honest, the more and more we see it, people don't have the additional space in their homes, so we do see a lot of seniors on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they come to you then for, for their needs, assistance, and, and the things that they, they are troubled by. Yeah. That's a good, that's a very good um, Indigenous communities are known for offering spiritual care, and that's rare in public services in Canada. You know, we don't get that first off. Um, what are the lessons you, that you offer for the wider community about the importance and the nature of spiritual care for seniors? Absolutely. Um, so we're one of the luckier communities. Um, we are in a central location. We're surrounded by cities. So Within our reach everywhere, we have Cranford and Toronto, we're close to Six Nations, which is absolutely amazing, and gives us the ability to have knowledge keepers um, and elders um, and our medicines close by, but it also provides a disadvantage. It's right outside city limits, and a lot of our seniors um, don't have transportation. So although our culture is being talked about more openly and accepted widely in the community, we still run into barriers. Um, for example, one of the big ones is the inability to smudge in public spaces. So um, as Life One Care, we visit a lot of seniors in our home, in long-term care homes, um, and in hospitals. And being able to provide them ceremony is one of the things they seek out often. Um, but a lot of the times, smudging is needed in ceremony and we don't have the ability to do so. So we do run into a lot of barriers that are that's a difficult for me to do. Yeah. Um, those are some of the challenges then. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, when, when you're talking about in um, long-term care homes, are, are those indigenous or are they mixed? Um, um, and did you say that I would love to be able to say that we have indigenous long-term care homes. Um, there is not one in the city. No. The only one that I do know of, there is one on Six Nations um, mm -hmm. that doesn't have a, a large amount of beds. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the only one I do know of. Yes. Right. So if that existed in the city, then these ceremonial practices could, could be um, wonderful. They could be done all the time and put people at peace in their senior years, which is it's a really important thing to be at peace, mm -hmm. I think, to who you are and, and what's happened to you. you know. Is there any hope that that might happen? That um, I have heard some talk that it's in the process, um, mm -hmm. early, early stages of um, just requests to build. I have no confirmation whatsoever that it's going through, but figures are from uh, Absolutely, because I think it's so needed. I love that idea, you mm -hmm. know, of that, just that separation, you know, because it's hard for, for uh, Indigenous seniors, I would think, to be with non-Indigenous seniors who don't understand the practices, and you never know what level of mental capability people are going to be at either, so there may be, you know, criticism, there might be, you know, um, dissension, we don't know. It just needs to be a separate thing. Absolutely, yeah. and to add on mm -hmm. to that, there's, not just the practices and ceremonies, but also the way um, Indigenous were raised um, when it comes to meal times. We don't eat at 5 o'clock mm -hmm. and get shuttled down yeah. to the dining room. Mm -hmm. um, we don't mm -hmm. eat catered food. We prefer to grow our own and cook our own and understand the nutrients we're putting in our bodies. And food from the land, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is really important. Mm -hmm. and it's like um, um, country food. I think that's what the Inuit call it, country food. 
makes them healthy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how can you, how would you see um, older indigenous people with mental difficulties, especially depression and dementia, how are they supported in the indigenous community or in the Hamilton community? Mm -hmm. What are they? Yeah, it's extremely difficult. Um, unfortunately, Hamilton does not offer any appropriate uh, culturally appropriate long-term care, like you said. Um, however, there are a few programs, um, myself as well as uh, some of the other programs within Hamilton Regional Indian Center, and we do have the ability to reach out and go to home visits, hospital visits, um, provide ceremonies and medicines, friendly visits, wellness calls, so we try to reach out to them if they can't come to us, um, but it's one of our biggest challenges. Do you find that hospitals are cooperative when you want to go in and visit an indigenous patient with a ceremonial, no, I'm not talking about smudge, but ceremonial um, attributes that they would want? Um, I think in the past it was more of a struggle. Mm -hmm. More recently, we've, um, we've built a really positive working relationship with all the social workers within the hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, so they do welcome us in to do ceremonies. Uh, as well as visiting. Mm -hmm. We've even went as far as putting diffusers with sage essential oils oh, in it to try and mimic the smudge. Mm -hmm. um, so at this time, we do have a very positive working very relationship. Good. Yeah, and I'm glad to hear that. So how could public services be improved? I mean, we talked about the idea of a, a, a long-term care home, mm -hmm. an indigenous long-term care home. Is there what could we be advocating for what, as, as non-Indigenous seniors? How can, that's the big question. How can we help? And I know a lot of people say that, but because they don't know. They just don't know what to do. And you made a suggestion, and when I asked you, about some of our seniors coming here to meet Indigenous seniors. And sometimes that works. You know, when, mm -hmm. when you meet people that are, are culturally different than you, you begin to understand and accept them. So I know you're going to put that out. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, and we'll put that in our resource list too mm -hmm. as well and let people know if you would like what's available for them to come and visit. Of course. Um, so we do hold a seniors program every Wednesday and Hamilton Regional Indian Center is status blind. So you don't have to be indigenous, you don't have to be native, you don't have to be status um, to attend and learn. Yeah, so one of the big things um, is we want to teach. We want to welcome people in. So we're, we always welcome newcomers. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's really good news because I think that we might find people coming. You know, and I, and I'd be very happy about that. I would be one of them. Wonderful. <laughs> Some of the other things that we see as a high need um, for Indigenous seniors, and I say this because um, I did actually reach out to some of our seniors and ask them what their opinions were and what their suggestions were. And a lot of the feedback I got was that affordable housing was number one, long-term care was number two, um, and assistance with uh, shopping trips and outings, mm -hmm. as a lot of them don't drive or require assistance to get out. So taking a taxi or a bus is just not convenient for them. No. So they're looking for programs like that. Um, that. And I understand that you have craft programs here too as well, which um, I mentioned it to one senior about reading. And she said, oh, I would love to do that. And I, I thought maybe you might have something here like that in the craft area. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. Hamilton Regional Indian Center has over 40 programs within our agency, mm -hmm. and that's servicing all um, ages zero to 100 or more, um, and all different walks of life. So all of our programs actually provide programming to the community that's interactive and cultural. Um, all of the programs also come with a meal. Um, so we get to sh sit, share a meal, yes. and then uh, get a teaching, do a craft. It's important. Yes, and all of the information is always on Facebook, and it's up to date constantly. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other thing that they were asking was um, how could faith communities mm -hmm. in Hamilton support older indigenous adults in the region? Um, the, uh, then we have a number of sponsors that have come forward for this panel. Um, the Catholic Diocese is one of the sponsors. 
the Lutheran Church um, concerned Lake Catholics is a group across Canada they're sponsoring because um, of the the stipends, the um, the gifts that we would like to give the speakers. And so um, I just wonder if there's like the faith communities, I realize we, we would be of different spiritual nature, you know. But they're interested in doing something within their own organizations. And some are already helping, but not directly related to urban indigenous seniors. And that's a, that's something that they were asking. Absolutely. Um, so this was one of the big questions I struggled with today, I'll be completely honest, and I did bring it to our seniors group. Um, and we believe that the best help is just listening and showing up, uh, participating and learning. So our ways are guided with love and support, um, and we want to share our knowledge so that people can pass this forward, um, and history can be rewritten. Yeah, so, and of course they love their shopping trips. <laughs> needs, um, how does that get provided? Is, is there a program here that helps them understand what their needs are in terms of um, uh, food, you know, um, menus, recipes, um, vitamins, you know, doctor care, medical care, nursing care, you know, all those things? Yeah, I think it's relatable to all of the senior programs within the city. Um, we do focus a little bit more holistically. Um, and for our cultural approach, mm -hmm. um, but seniors don't get any, or indigenous seniors don't get any additional funding that a regular senior would, other than their pension or CPP. Okay. Um, so there isn't any government funding additional mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. um, HRIC does have a food bank, so we do help with that. Um, they're able to access it once a month. We also have um, the luxury of having free produce that we can disperse throughout the community um, weekly. So everyone comes and stops by. And, yeah, and we try to talk about like um, some nice recipes. One day we made ginger lemon tea and the same we loved it. Uh -huh. um, so Lifelong Care has also partnered up with IDHC um, and they deliver a free of charge um, diabetes foot care program and mm -hmm. deliver diabetes education mm -hmm. uh, for when needed for seniors. And then the lifelong care program will assist with uh, any other education or medical needs. What's in that sense? sense? What is that you see? Um, the Indigenous Diabetes Health Care okay. Circle. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah. 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 yeah, because that is more, that has been more of the prevalent diseases among the indigenous people on the reserve like Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Question. Okay, so let's see. The Hamilton Regional Indian Center, the Lifelong Care Program. Our history. In 1972, a group of Aboriginal people established a temporary cultural center housed on Park Street South. The people felt it was a great need 
for a gathering place in the Hamilton community. After a lot of hard work and encouragement from the Secretary of State, the Aboriginal Community Letters Patent were issued on June 19th, 1973. The founding members were Stuart, Helen, and Elwood Cecile Mentor. Our vision is creating change that empowers urban Aboriginal people with the mission to provide the urban Aboriginal people with tools to achieve a balanced holistic lifestyle. All programs are based on cultural healing, ceremonies, smudging, four medicines, drumming circles, teachings, medicine walks, sweat lodges, and sacred fires are a few of the tools we use within our practice. Hamilton Regional Indian Center has over 40 programs and two locations. Today, we're here to talk about our Lifelong Care Program. The Lifelong Care Program provides holistic approach to urban Indigenous community members, regardless of age, who are disabled, chronically ill, frail, elderly, who have HIV AIDS or require a continuum of care for acute or chronic illness. We strive to enhance and improve the quality of life and living for the clients. Eligibility for our program is anyone who is disabled, chronically ill, frail, elderly, who have HIV AIDS or require a continuum of care for acute or chronic illness. This includes mental health, developmental disabilities, anyone who falls under the autism spectrum. We provide short-term or long-term care dependent on needs. And one of the biggest things that I'm proud to say is we are status blind, meaning you do not need to be Métis or First Nations status to qualify. What does LLC do? We provide cultural services, teachings and ceremonies. We assist with transportation to medical appointments. We provide one-to-ones with clients who require support. We facilitate team meetings and case conferences. We assist with identification needs. We provide home visits, wellness checks, crisis calls. We also support families who require access visits with CAS. We will attend medical appointments with our clients if needed for support or advocacy. We run a free monthly diabetic foot care clinic. We provide weekly congregate dining for seniors. We support clients with end of life plans and advocacy is one of our biggest needs. We, ass we assist with obtaining accessible devices like walkers, wheelchairs. We liaise with medical professionals of care teams, doctors, LIHN, specialists, Action Medical, and so much more. We assist to create care plans. We navigate resources to create a smooth transition from hospital to home. And we support general practitioners with forums for ODSP, DARTS, and diabetic foot care. Hamilton Regional Indian Center has two locations. Our main location is 34 Ottawa Street North. You can contact myself at extension 223 or Sam, my coworker at extension 228. You can also contact us directly on the cell phone at 365-323-7657. Our second location is 407 King Street, which is our drop-in center for housing and homelessness. At the drop-in center, we provide three meals a day and have support staff available to anyone who requires support. Niigwech, and thank you for your interest and time. I hope to hear from some of you soon so we can include you in our programming. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone, and I will turn it over to Ellen. I'd like to thank all our, our, our speakers, including Tiana, who uh, isn't with us. Uh, so glad that she's able to uh, attend an out-of-time conference. Uh, thank uh, Kitty and Val for being just inspiring role models uh, for uh, older uh, adults with uh, uh, grace and spirit and uh, ingenuity and energy. Thank you so much for your contributions and for teaching us about them. 
and and for Tiana, who's a a future um, in in a in a you know a generation or two, uh, will also be uh, an older adult contributing uh, in similar ways. I think uh, so. We, we're really privileged to have uh, heard from these three wonderful people, and also from uh, Donna, who has such a, a way of uh, uh, befriending uh, wonderful people. I want to bring to your attention some upcoming events that might be of interest to you. There, uh, this information it will be included in the resource list. The grandmother's tea is provided by an organization, Nation, Nations Uniting, on a monthly basis, and there's one coming up next week. In case some of you would be available to hop in the car and go to uh, Six Nations. The contact is on the screen, but uh, more helpfully in the resource list that we'll be sending out. Uh, on May 27th, a month, a little more than a month from now, again on a Saturday afternoon, Concerned Lay Catholics of Canada is presenting a, a presentation from the Kateri Center near Ottawa, the Church and Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, that's another opportunity that might be of interest. And there are two more that we're highlighting. Donna mentioned the indigenous blanket exercise that Val will be leading uh, at St. Joseph's Church in Hamilton at the beginning of June. Uh, that one uh, has a fee of $20 per person. And, and also uh, many of you will know that there's currently an, uh, an exhibit for the last couple of months called Radical Stitch, a traveling Canadian exhibit at the local art gallery. Radical Stitch uh, presents uh, uh, beading um, in, in a wonderful way uh, as part of indigenous culture and, uh, and uh, gives uh, visibility to the work of, I think I saw a list of 20 artists from across Turtle Island. So that's of interest and available for the next month. It's really wonderful to be uh, highlighting activities that are in person, not just uh, Zoom. I think by Zoom, we can, we've can we had a lot of opportunity and will continue to have access from our homes. But as has been highlighted, the opportunity to be, to get together is very important for all of us. And these are some opportunities. Uh, this slide, and, and uh, when you see it on the video, I think you'll be able to stop it and, and click on the, the two links. But um, these links are also given in the, in the resource list. The, uh, we invite you as a gesture of support and appreciation for our speakers. Uh, invite you to make a donation to the Woodland Cultural Center, which is museum and residential school site in Brantford. And uh, I will uh, click on this now and see, I'll bring up the, um, the resource list and it, it maybe is going to show up. And, uh, and then I, I will also, um, so we have a repetition of of this information about events and a couple of extra events, and then um, some suggested books and most importantly, websites. And we have uh, the links to uh, Tiana's uh, uh, Friendship Center at the Hamilton Regional Indian Center, her website and her email address. So you can join the Facebook page for Hamilton Regional Indian Center or send an email to subscribe to Tiana's newsletter if you're interested. Uh, I think, I think. oh, there are a couple of other uh, comments. Every, all of our speakers uh, spoke about the importance of, of sharing food and uh, socializing, the importance for seniors of socializing and the importance for those of us non-Indigenous as we encounter Indigenous seniors to be to be uh, have our listening ears on, and uh, and that that's an important way of uh, of connecting uh, and learning about uh, aging issues and the issues of uh, 
uh, of importance to people in the indigenous communities that we encounter. I wanted to say that if, if any of you are not registered with me for this event, uh, you could put your email address as a couple of people already have, put your email address in the chat so we can add you to the list for distributing the link to this recording and to the uh, listing of upcoming events and uh, resources. And also you could let us know if you're interested in possible follow-up activities, perhaps some small group activities, uh, learning or uh, visiting with indigenous seniors uh, as a small group, for example, uh, to learn beading at the uh, in, uh, a friendship center or uh, to uh, go in a small group to a, a powwow or to one of the grandmother's teas. I think the grandmother's teas really fits our age group. Uh, so uh, some of us might plan to go together to one of those at one, uh, one of the monthly events that's coming along. Thank you.